Hey guys, before we start episode 288, I just want to say that this week's edition of the Hoots Podcast is in dedication to the late, great Brody Lee, who unfortunately passed away this time last year. Um, today, as we record this on Thursday, uh, December 16th, would have been Brody Lee's 42nd birthday. And um, what you're going to hear right now is a little audio montage of clips I pulled up from YouTube this morning. I just want to give... A big shout out to uh, the late, great Brody Lee. I really enjoyed covering his work over the years. And uh, it's just a terrible tragedy that came to all of us in the wrestling landscape where you're a performer in the business, a fan, someone who covers the industry like I do. Uh, Brody was a legend and you'll never be forgotten. And uh, I want to dedicate this week's episode of the Who's Podcast to him. Shout out to Brody Lee. Hope you enjoyed the montage and hope you enjoy episode 288 of the Who's Podcast. Uh, yes, sir. I've never had a harder time coming up with words in front of a camera than right now. What more can be said about Brody Lee that hasn't already been said, but that's the comforting part. To see the outpouring, the incredible outpouring from all over the world, from the fans who respected Brody Lee to all the people in this business that he touched with his presence, his smile, his sarcastic wit. His levity. Brody liked to stir the pot. He liked to get guys all riled up just for the entertainment of the locker room. And that's the kind of guy he was. He brought joy to the people around him. I had the privilege of spending over a decade with Brody on a journey from armories and bingo halls to packed arenas and stadiums. Brody loved being a dad. Husband and father above all else. This was just a job. He used to tell me about it all the time. Oh, it's great. You're going to love it. Said, no, no, not for me. I like being able to do whatever I want. You know, stay out all night, order Chinese food at 2 a.m. He says, I wouldn't trade you for the world. And 2020 has hit us all hard over and over and over, some harder than others. But this, to give an analogy that I think Brody would like, is like a pride soccer style kick right to the face of the pro wrestling community. But when I think of what I've learned over this year as the calendar turns over to 2021, when I think of Amanda and the kids, I realize that's exactly what pro wrestling is. It's a community. It's not just a sport. It is a community. When the chips are down, we support each other. We love each other. Men and women from all over the world brought together by this one thing that we love. And tonight we come together again to rage against the dying of the light, to celebrate a great human being whose legacy, I hope, inspires us all to be a little bit better of a person every single day, to appreciate the people we love around us every single day, to appreciate, stop and smell the roses every single sunset, every sunrise, every day. I know I will. Because every day is a gift, every day is special. And every day that I got to spend with Brody was just all the more special, and I'm grateful for that. And I love you, brother. And I'll never forget you. Stars, you may not always see them, but they're always there for you. And he was, uh, Brody was exactly like that. Brody really connected with all of us on such a, on a human level that he reminded us of what was real, what was important, and what matters. When I had my neck injury in 2015, he sent me a video of uh, his son, young Brody, playing with my action figure and, you know, uh, wishing me well. It meant a lot at the time, and now, I, it's, now it, it's so priceless. Because to show you what kind of man Harper was. I mean, he really was just the best. He was such, such a great friend, uh, such a great human, great daddy, great husband. Most of our bonding came from, you know, the the bond of fatherhood. Both of us would be in such awe that we were parents, and that we were able to create these little beings, you know, these little versions of ourselves. If there was a Mount Rushmore of wrestling dads, uh, Brody should be on that Mount Rushmore. 
after show. He would drive like eight to ten hours just to get home as quickly as possible to be with his kids because he loved his boys, he loved his wife Amanda uh, so much and always wanted to be with them. He's a good guy. He's a really good guy. He can make you think that he was the biggest, baddest, most evil monster, villain, bad guy, wrestler in the world, but then if he lets you in and he really lets you see his eyes for what they were, you saw one of the kindest uh, men that I have ever met. He was one of a kind. And Brody he was. He was the man. Here's the I love you, and I miss you, and with these videos you live on forever, but you're always going to live on forever in my heart. Bye. I love you, man, and I miss you, and I'll see you one day again. My friend, I love you, and I miss you. The last thing I said to him was, I love you, though. I love you. Goodbye forever. Which is what we said to each other. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. <laughs> I know it. I love when he does that. Well, once you hit rock bottom, the only way to go is up. So, so good luck, okay? Good luck. You say rock bottom, but, like... It just seems like things keep getting worse. What What is rock bottom? Who decides what's the bottom of all this? I mean, seriously, you go, okay, today is Friday, and I woke up in Cleveland, and I'm going, how much worse can it get? I never believed in dreaming. It never got me very far. I never believed that love could find me. Like an arrow through the heart. Yeah. Hey. 
Welcome to episode 288 of the Who's Podcast. It's your truly and the fairies where Adam flying solo this week. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh Lopez Media. Hit me up at Instagram at Josh Lopez94. That's J-O-S-H-I-E Lopez94 at Josh Lopez Music. If you want to see me do some guitar covers, hope well, you guys are having a wonderful week. I'm recording this on a Thursday, it's December 16, 2021. Um, for those wondering, I know we got the holidays coming up, but don't fret. You will be getting new editions of the Who's Podcast on Thursday. Uh, we caught, we kind of caught a break with the schedule this year, so the holidays won't affect our recording schedule. So you'll get a brand new episode next week before Christmas, and you'll get a new episode before the New Year. So uh, looking to wrap up uh, 2021 with a bang, and uh, these last final three episodes uh, go out a bang, and we're getting closer and closer and closer to episode 300, and I'm sure probably by New Year, I'll probably mention something about if you guys want to send any like audio shout-outs or something to um, pay homage to the 300 episode. We'll get to that uh, when that time comes around, but um just want to say hope you guys are having a blessed day and you're enjoying the time with your families and uh, not taking anything for granted. Hope you guys are in good spirits as we're in this holiday spirit and not trying to find reasons to stress yourself out. Uh, you know, just taking things one day at a time and have some fun. So we got a lot to talk about this week. Um, of course, we'll have What the Hell is Wrong with AEW to main event uh, this week's podcast. So, like I said, I'm flying solo. Brett Carter had his final appearance on the show for 2021. So uh, it's just you and me, guys. So let's have some fun. Let's wrap up 2021 with a bang. And we got a lot to talk about. Of course, we got the Q&A session, which we're going to get into in a couple minutes. And, of course, we got... Um, this week in WWE, but also uh, in the podcast this week, you guys are going to hear my thoughts on what went down with the best uh, Super Juniors in the World Tag League as that just concluded yesterday. And um, uh, we got announcements for the cards for Wrestle Kingdom Night 1 and 2. Uh, we'll get into that as well. So sit back, relax, strap it down, as Hawk Harrison used to say back in the day with the Chicago White Sox, is it's time for another brand new edition of the Hoops Podcast. Uh, really quick, I do want to mention, um, outside of the social media, so please, if you could, if you're an Apple Podcast listener and this is your first time listening to the podcast, thank you. Big shout out to you. Uh, all I ask for you guys is to download uh, the podcast and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. You'll follow it on Spotify. Tell your friend about it. Tell everybody to check out the Hoops Podcast and um, we're having a lot of fun here and pumping out some really, really good shows recently. And I really thank all of you for those who take the time to um, listen or watch the podcast. We also have a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com backslash who's podcast if you want to check it out. And um, again, I just want to uh, express my gratitude for each and every single one of you because I don't know why the hell any of you would care or want to listen to what I have to say about wrestling. So uh, I just want to say... Uh, Big shout out to all of you. All right, let's get to the Q&A, shall we? Uh, the Good Brothers Q&A session, as always, um, brought to you by the Good Brothers, uh, Chris Saletta and Nate the Great. Uh, we're going to start it off with Chris here. You can follow me on Twitter at xcenesaletta24x on Twitter. He says, um, what, what up, Oops? Here's some questions for the Q&A this week. What will the rest of the Wrestle Kingdom card look like in your mind? Oh, man. It's kind of early to get to that. I, I am going to talk about the wrestling card that's already announced right now. Um, but I, I I have to save my answer for that question until we get to that segment, okay? I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to skip your question, buddy. But I have to answer that when we get to the New Japan segment. But from what I've seen so far, it, I'm, I'm really intrigued. And it should be a couple of fun nights of wrestling to type down. Uh, I'm probably not going to get any sleep again, but when do I ever do get sleep? <laughs> uh, here's a question. Um, thoughts on Grayson Waller and the heat he gets? Uh, I like Grayson Waller. Um, I don't know why they changed the theme song. Um, I like this old one. Uh, it even fits in with him being the bad guy now. But I like Grayson Waller. I saw his rise and start in 205 Live and what he's doing right now. Uh, he's uh, playing a uh, I, I guess he's trying to be the anti wrestling Twitter dude. Um, like maybe he's just like it's his uh, being the um, 
polar example of what wrestling Twitter hates in a wrestler. So that's how he's deriving his heat off of it. I could be wrong, but I, that, that's my takeaway from what I've seen so far. He's like, he's just being the opposite of the uh, quote unquote indie darling type of guy. And that's his stick. And that's why he wants to make a meal and stuff. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I I like I like it I like his work in the ring. Um, he's had some good matches so far. That his performance at War Games was good. So I'm I'm a fan of Grayson Waller. I like what I've seen so far. Um, next question: AW's best five women in their division. Oh man, that's a good question. Um, Britt Baker, um, of course, Thunder Rosa. Ty Conti, uh, Ruby Soho, and then um, what's her face? Uh, Statlander. There you go, Chris Statlander. They'll be those are the top five in my opinion right now. Uh, next question: Will Khalil Mack be a bear after this season? I think he will. I, I just don't know what you're going to get in return for Mac as far as the trade is concerned. Um, I don't know who is that desperate for an aging outside out, outside linebacker. Um, Mac's still a good player. I just don't see him um, leaving the team after this season. And to be honest with you guys, as much as I know a lot of people are expecting changes with the Bears and stuff like that, I, I don't think it's going to be like some big scale rebuild where the team is like 2 and 15 and 1 and 16 the next couple of seasons it's just i i feel like there are talent that has been drafted here that could help have some stability after the changes are made uh, and there is talent on the team uh obviously there needs to be a change of philosophy with the people that are hiring people uh, the people they're evaluating, the scouting department, et cetera. So I get all of that. But I, when I look at the team and the way the roster is structured outside the veterans, there are talented young guys on this team. And I don't think the Bears are in a position where they're like, oh, we're going to be a shitty team for the next five to ten years. Um, and if Justin Fields is what people are trying to make him out to be, I don't see why they can't find a way to get back to a winning record sooner than later. You know what I mean? So – and you still got Mac under contract for another two or three years, I think. So uh, it's up to him. If, if it's something that he would want to request a trade, then more power to him. But with where the Bears are at right now, and I know there's going to be sweeping changes and stuff like that in the offseason, I just don't think that's going to happen where they're going to trade a guy. I, I, don't, I don't see that happening. Um, who would you like to see challenge Nakamura for the IC title? Mm, good question. You know what? Uh, I I like to see uh, Sheamus fight uh, Nakamura for the IC title. There you go. That's my pick for that one. Thoughts on Urban Meyer mess and now the firing in Jacksonville. <laughs> oh, man. I could do a whole show on Urban Meyer and his nonsense. Um, Chris, I'll, I'll just tell you this, man. Um, it's this is not me to come out like, oh, you have an out for the, uh, the Khan family and blah, 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 blah. Oh, you're so anti-AW, blah, 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 blah. What I'm saying is just sheer facts. The Jacksonville Va- Jaguars are the most incompetent run football organization in the NFL. And probably in all professional sports, if we're being honest. Um <laughs> When there's disputes with teams, uh, uh, disputes with players leaving the team, Uh, I remember that whole thing with Tony Khan and Unique Ngakwe uh, going back and forth on Twitter a couple seasons ago. You had this thing now with Urban Meyer where one week he didn't want to fly home with the team. Now he's kicking players. He's outing out his assistant coaches. He's doing this. He's doing that. And I look at Urban Meyer, and he's a complete joke, and he's a complete representation of the Jaguars and how they're run. Yeah, you fired Urban Meyer. Yeah, you're probably going to have another GM for the fifth time in 10 years. It sounds like the Bears, right? When do you get to the point where you start calling out Shad Khan 
for being just one of the most in-depth NFL owners out there. Outside of that one year where they made the AFC title game, what tells you that this is a good run organization? What tells you that? I I don't get <laughs> what they're trying to do there. And the fact that you fired your first year coach with your follow-up number one overall draft pick. Um in the same season though, like the season that ain't over, the guy's already fired. I just don't know what they're doing down there. It's it's it, like you said, it's a mess. It's a dumpster fire. It's a shit show. It's a clown show. It's anything you want to call it. I don't understand what their mindset down there is in Jacksonville, and uh, you just got the wrong people running an NFL team. I feel bad for anybody that's a Jacksonville Jaguar fan. But what incentive do you have to watch their games now? Hell, even when you watch their games, you have half the crowd represented by the visiting team. Like, do you remember that game a few weeks ago with the 49ers there? It was, like, all red. I was like, hey, is this a different stadium? (laughs) So, I'm not surprised but what I've seen so far from the Jaguars in this whole situation with Urban Meyer, because this was going to be a complete dumpster fire from the get-go. And again, it's just another prime example that the Jaguars are the most in-depth run sports organization in the entire world. It's it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Um, I, I don't know what else to add to that. Um, with the regular season coming close over the next few weeks, how many coaches do you think will be fired? Uh, I'd probably say three or four. Um, I'll see like a big batch of firings, but I could probably see three or four. That'd probably be my answer for that question. Then the last one here from Chris here, he says, is there any post WWE talent that's impressed you with their work over the last two years? Oh uh, man, that's a good question. I'll say I've been kind of impressed with the stuff I see from Matt Cardona, but it's one thing for him to be a sympathetic baby face on Impact and then being a outright uh, heel and stuff like that on NWA and the stuff he's doing with the the Outlaw Mud Show Wrestling, uh, GCW. Uh, I, I don't have time for that shit. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't care for hardcore wrestling. I just don't. Um, so Matt Cardona, I, I've enjoyed some of his work outside of WWE. Uh, you guys know how I feel about FTR and how great they are as a performers in a tag team. Uh, I think Miro started to pick up some momentum. Uh, I've always been a Malachi Black fan. Uh, it's, that's a great question. I mean, you know, you look at across the landscape in wrestling today and who's been let go and this and that. Honestly, I haven't seen one game-changing game, change, game changing guy. And, you, you know, all respect to Moxley and everything he's do, he's dealing with right now. Like, even then when he joined AEW, I didn't feel like it was some game-changing moment. I, I never felt that, you know. And um, I try to look at the landscape, and I cover a lot of wrestling shows, so it's like... It's not I'm just WWE or AEW. I, I do New Japan. I do Impact. I do other shows ar- around the industry. And I haven't found one guy that's like, or a girl, that's been groundbreaking. It's like, I can't believe they were let go. I can't find one. And I'm just being honest with you guys. A lot of the people that have been let go and showed up in AEW are basically in the same position as they were when they were in WWE. Um, so I'm curious to see who of the new batch of these releases will make an impact or do something major or, uh, do something that's groundbreaking and elite, but all puns attended there. Uh, I just, I need to be impressed more because I, 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 I like Matt Cardona, but do I think he's a guy that's going to be a face of a company? No, I, I need to see more. I need to see more. I need to see more than uh, rip off 
Moxley uh, commercials or they're escaping prison and stuff like that after they get released. Like, we get the metaphor, right? We get the analogy. Uh, I will say, I think Steve Macklin has uh, impressed me in impact of what he's done recently and uh, how he's switched up his character. Uh, Diana Perrazzo is another one I should mention as well. I shouldn't forget her. Uh, so, those are the few select ones that pop up at the top of my head as far as that question is concerned. But that's a good one, uh, Chris. I think thank you for the questions as always this week, my man. And then the last batch of questions here comes from uh, Nate the Great here at Twitter at Psycho the Geary. So here we go. Um, last couple of questions here. Uh, here he, so he says, what would be your reaction if CM Punk wins the title for Paige? Well, here's my question, Nate. Is this a baby face versus baby face match or is CM Punk's the heel? If CM Punk's the heel, then fine. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that. If he's a good guy and he beats Heyman Page, it has to come with the reasoning behind it. If this is something where they want to rush a match with him and Heyman Page for Revolution or the battle the belts, I just don't see the point behind it. Um, you want to rush Puck Page to Revolution? Do you want to hold it off for double or nothing? I'm not saying that Puck can't have a AEW World Title match, but as to see a Puck fan, uh, him in the title picture, you have to have him in the right circumstances to be in the picture. You can't just drop it in and say, oh, this is CM Punk title shot. You know, it will play into this whole double um, standard uh, thing where, you know, people will bitch about Goldberg coming in and getting child shots or Batista coming in and getting child shots. But if CM Punk just automatically is dropped in to a match with Hangman Page with no build-up and no rhyme or reason to it, oh, it's just CM Punk against Hangman Page, which I'm going to get to this conversation later on. I feel like AW puts too much on emphasis of a great wrestling match than telling an actual story and actually producing a great wrestling television show. And, you know, just doing things because, oh, it looks nice on paper. And, oh, I'm a, a former uh, wrestling observer um, fanboy <laughs> and chat member. Uh, message board geek. Like, I... I that 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 does nothing for me. So like when you look at Steve Puck and Heyman Page, that's me the right circumstance. Is this a babyface babyface match? Is the uh, is Puck a heel? Is Heyman Page a heel? Like how's the parameters? If Steve Puck won a title and there's some rhyme and reason to it, awesome. I think it'd be cool. But this is just a match to say, oh hey, this is I I need a I need a match to pop Meltzer and Alvarez. So here, here everybody, here's the what you're being. Here's CM Punk and Heyman Page. Oh, here's CM Punk and Adam Cole. Uh, but they'll build up on Dynamite for whatever reason. Or uh, CM Punk against Brian Danson on Rampage, just because oh, CM Punk and Brian Danson on Rampage. You need to have more rhyme races than wrestler here, wrestler here, and then oh, there you go. You know what I mean? Uh, this is a good question, though. Um, who do you think Shibata should face at Wrestle Kingdom? Well, originally, uh, they, I was going to say Ishii, <laughs> just because I want to see them fight each other again. But um, I don't know. That's a great question. I, 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 you know what? I'll go with Ibushi. I think Kota Ibushi should be the guy to fight Shibata. I think it'd be pretty cool. They have somebody named X, so I don't know if it's uh, somebody coming from the New Japan Strong contingent of uh, New Japan. Is it Jay White? Does Jay White come in and fight Shibata? I don't know. Is it Ibushi? That'd be cool. Is it the Strong Openweight Champion Tom Waller? I have no idea. I'm being curious to see who it is, though, for sure. Uh, I'm, uh, the announcement with Shibata making his entering return at Wrestle Kingdom is just pretty cool. It's something I didn't think would happen again. Uh, again, for full disclosure, when I first started like, covering New Japan shows, it was strictly Wrestle Kingdom shows. I didn't do the whole schedule and 
stuff like that. I think the first Wrestle Kingdom show I did was in 2014, I think, or 15, somewhere around there, the Wrestle Kingdom 9 show. And then um, I, I, I did, like, the Shibata and Ishii match. And, you know, you look at, uh, you know, Shibata had a match with Okada, I think, one time that I covered. But I didn't get to cover Shibata matches regularly because I went to do the regular schedule. This is something more recent over the last two or three years that I've been doing every single New Japan show. So um, I'm just very excited and I'm, I'm, it, it's just cool in general, regardless of who he fights the rest of the kingdom, that uh, Shabbat is back. I, just, I think it's awesome. It's a nice incentive for Wrestle Kingdom this year as well. It's a nice attraction and um, can be happy for Shibata, and I can't wait to uh, see who he fights. It should be a lot of fun. Um, yeah, here's an interesting question. Um, does transcribing ever feel like a chore to you? Well, transcribing is my job, you know. Uh, I'm sure there's good days and bad days, just like anybody else with any other type of job. I have a very unique job, and I have a very unique uh platform and um, I'm trying to find a different word for it, but I have a different um, service that I'm doing basically, right? You guys know how the deal is. I'm not just saying so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so beat so-and-so in this match and, you know, here's my bookie take on it. I'm, I'm not even uh, again, I'm not doing like the reviews that you would see from like uh, ProWrestling.net or stuff like that. I'm not giving you my thoughts on the show I'll tell you what happened on the show and a lot of it is a, a different tool for a lot of different things I'm using it one for you guys to use it as a point of reference for those who don't have time to catch up with the shows or if you do a show like this or um, a video show or regardless um, or, or even if you're a wrestling coach and you um, need to Educate your uh, students on some things. I I leave no stone unturned because I'm paying respects to the performers, the agents, the producers who put these matches together. I'm not gonna act. I'm not gonna come here and act like I know more than they do. It's my interpretation of what they did, and you know, just doing this for the last seven to eight years, I'm doing my best to project what happened in the ring, and let you guys know what happened there. Now, when it comes to the promos, that's all fair game because, hey, I am not responsible for promo segments not making sense. You know what I mean? Uh, is there times where I feel a little, like, fatigued and burned out with doing transcripts? Of course. Uh, you know, doing 20 wrestling shows weeks can burn you out. You know, as much as I'm a wrestling fan, I, sometimes I don't need to watch as much wrestling as I do throughout the week. But I love it, too. You guys know how much I love wrestling. That's hence why we have this podcast, right? Uh, but I, I never get to the point where I feel like, oh, I, I got to do this. I got to do that. Like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, the chore aspect of it is when AEW decides to do 15 or 18 match cards. Excuse me one second. Yeah, when, like, AEW does... 15 or 18 match cards on AW Dark or Elevation. It's just, it's just unnecessary. And uh, I'm a person that values the time that I put into these cr- uh, transcripts, and there has to be return on investment on it. Uh, if I'm doing something, it has to be worth my time. This is my job. It's not something that I do for fun. Uh, this is what I do for a living. This is how I make money. This is how I pay for my apartment. And um, I'm glad to say that I'm at Top in top of my field when it comes to making transcripts, and I'm having fun. I feel like uh, I'm proud of the work that I put out this year. Especially, I think it's probably the most amount of articles I ever done in my career so far in the wrestling media. And I just hope people appreciate the time and effort I put into these articles and what they represent because it's based on accuracy and you know just tell you what happened on the show. I'm not telling you this is a four or five star match. I really don't care about that stuff. You guys know me. I'm not I'm not down with the meltrification of professional wrestling. I really don't have time or care for that shit. I really don't. I don't care about booking. I don't care if something's a four or five star match. 
Uh, I'm not in it to find out who's a draw or not. I really don't care about that behind the scenes stuff. I'll care about the behind the scenes stuff when I'm actually in the wrestling business and it affects me personally. You know, all this stuff that everybody gets in these silly debates about on Twitter and so like that. It's like it's none of your business. It's none of your business why Kevin Owens decided to re-sign with the WWE. Has also it's also another reason why it's none of your business why so so. Uh, got broken up. Like it's none of your guys' business. We're not entitled to know what's going on with these performers' personal lives. They make the decisions for their own. Let them live their life, live within their own decisions. We don't need. I, I, I don't get the fatuation with people on Twitter. Always feel like they have to be the fucking authority on every single thing that happens in wrestling today. One, you you probably don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And B, it's none of your business. So, <laughs> I mean, when, it, when I look at it from a transfer point of view, it's not a chore. Uh, the chore aspect sometimes is when, like, we have these super lengthy editions of Dark. But outside of that, I mean, I feel like um, it's a good day for me that I have this memory bank of mood sets and... You know, I have a different approach to the coverage that I put in from a WWE show and a New Japan show and AEW show. I'll have I have different experiences with every transfer that I make with every promotion that I cover. So I have fun. I like the challenge. Uh, it's a lot of work. I can get uh, fatigued and burn out sometimes, but uh, I never get to the point where it's such a chore that I don't want to do it. Uh, that's that's the thing. So. Um, I want to thank uh, Chris and Nate for the awesome questions this week, this week guys. As always, I appreciate it. If you want to participate in the Good Birds Q&A session, all you have to do is hit me up on Twitter at uh, Josh Lippitz Media or email us to hootspodcast at gmail.com. When we come back, I'm going to talk about what happened this week in WWE right here on the Hoots Podcast. Give me a minute, please. Yeah. Yeah. Check this out. Look at that. Wow, that's impressive. Good? Yeah. 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 Uh, not really. Well, you think maybe I should give you something for that? Like maybe a pat on the back? Uh-huh. Like maybe a trophy of some kind, a participation trophy. Anything. Oh, then maybe something really important. Like maybe my autograph on a doily. Okay. Yeah. No. I, I just, I think if I had a match, I could really show you what I'm capable of. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, the thing is, you, you barge in here. You know what? Uh, I'm talking to someone really important, and you barge in here and you act like, I don't know, like we're friends or something. Like we're buddies, right? I, I, yeah. You, you have that feeling, right? You want to feel that way. Yeah. I understand. I, I just thought that, you know, if I, if I, did what you said, and I followed your lessons, it would... Shut up! You're not my friend. I don't have any friends. Because I don't want any friends. You haven't impressed me yet. I don't... don't... You don't know what to say, right? So what I'm going to do is... Uh, I don't like to do this. But you put me in free my mind. I'm going to do... Uh, I have to use one of the most deadly weapons in the world. And I'm going to like... I'm going to like doing it. Pencil? A pencil? I don't, I don't understand. You see, this is not the Emporium. This is the Emporium. The Eraser. The Eraser? The Eraser? Wow! <laughs> I was not expecting that this week on television. The Eraser, pal! 
<laughs> you got the most dangerous weapon in professional wrestling, the eraser. I thought uh, I thought roll ups and wrestling Twitter was uh, wrestling's uh, most dangerous weapon. Maybe today's most dangerous weapon, but hey, man, you guys heard it right there on worldwide television on Monday Night Raw this week. Uh, Miss Meek Mahan uh, telling Austin Theory the story about the Eraser, and he's not wrong, folks. The most dangerous weapon in professional wrestling is not a steel chair. It's not. A kendo stick. It's not even a flaming table, Cody Rhodes. Hell, it's not even uh, being friends with Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. Uh, the most dangerous weapon in professional wrestling today is the Eraser. And you guys will learn about the Eraser at DSU, by the way. Um, DSU, I think uh, our professor, JD from New York, needs uh, to understand the theory about the Eraser as well. Because... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to keep that to myself. Um, <laughs> let's talk about what happened this week in WWE, folks. Uh, as you guys are listening to the Hoots Podcast, again, big shout out to all of you who uh, enjoyed the podcast this week. I love you guys, and you guys motivate me to continue on with this show, so I appreciate all of you. Uh, we're going to start off with SmackDown, as we always do. Um, as I'm recording this on Thursday, tomorrow, SmackDown is going to be at the Rosemont Horizon, and I don't know if I'm going to be there or not. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting question, you know. I I I, I haven't heard anything yet. Uh, I may or may not be at SmackDown this week, uh, so fingers crossed. But if not, it'd be cool. It's to be all right. Uh, I I'm curious to see what's going to go down because uh, last week was um, <laughs> comedy time with Brock Lesnar and Sami Zayn. But you know, you're getting a comedy with Brock Lesnar and Sami Zayn. And here's the thing I wanted to mention here because you, you always get throughout the year some. Maybe a talent may not be on television for a couple of weeks or so. Blah blah. They're inter, uh, they're kind of switching around, shuffling around the uh, fuse and stuff in the programs. You know what I mean? And somebody may be lost in the shuffle. And they're like, "Oh, this person is buried. Oh, they never they did Sami Zayn wrong. They never treated Sami Zayn right." When you look back in a year or so, <laughs> this when you. Put that take out there that Sami Zayn's buried and he he wasn't treated right and oh he should leave. Uh, don't forget he's involved in probably the top program in the company right now with Brock Lesnar and Roman Reigns and he's doing good TV. I I what do I say each week here on the podcast, guys? You got to maximize your TV time. Don't I say that each and every single week? Because it's true, you got to maximize your TV time. If you don't, what's the consequence? The eraser. It's a simple fact of life. You look at the stuff that Brock Lesnar and uh, Sam Zayn has been doing over the last couple weeks. It's been pretty cool. The tribe chief decided that he wanted to go on vacation. And the tribal chief will be making his return. And his fir- the first time the tribal chief is actually at the Rosemont Horizon tomorrow, which should be pretty cool. Uh, the tribal chief, tribal chief. Man, you guys are fucking man. Uh, I'm really curious to see this because not only you're getting the comedy stuff with Brock Lesnar and same scene, but you're also getting again that open ended question: Whose side is Paul Heyman on? Is he on the side of the Trial Chief? Is he on the side of Brock Lesnar? They're still, you know, dropping those little Easter eggs here and there about Brock Lesnar. Is he still in cahoots with Paul Heyman? And you never know that question, but we know one thing. <laughs> one thing we get guaranteed each and every, every single week, Kayla Braxton and her good waterfall will pop up behind from uh, Paul Heyman. So I looked at SmackDown this week, and uh, let me pull up the article real quick so I can get my information correct. And um, SmackDown this past Friday uh, was in the Staples Center in L.A., we just went over the uh, Brock Lesnar and Sami Zayn segment. Uh, by the way, I also want to send my condolences to the family of uh, the late, great Black Jack Lanza, who unfortunately passed away last week. Um, Lanza, a legend in the wrestling industry and a legendary pr- uh, agent and producer during the Attitude Era. So uh, I want to get my thoughts and prayers out to uh, Black Jack Lanza. I, I actually saw the Black Jacks go into the WWE Hall of Fame 
Uh, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was uh, 11 years old. It was Russell, the weekend of WrestleMania 22. And they had the Hall of Fame at the Rosemont Theater here. And we got to see the Black Jacks. They were part of the 2006 class, which was pretty cool. So I got to see them go to the Hall of Fame. Great tag team from the Territory Days. And uh, a legend that will be never forgotten. Um we had uh, Drew McIntyre on the show fighting Sheamus, a fun match. Uh, these two always rip it up in the ring. Uh, I will mention this, um, and I'm going to mention this a lot when it comes to Raw in a couple of minutes, but I feel like there's been kind of a shift in the uh, philosophy on Raw and SmackDown where I think I kind of mentioned this after the draft was done, but it's like, you know, you have um, with SmackDown, it's so fixated with Roman Reigns and everything that's going on because it is SmackDown is Roman Reigns show so everything around it is window dressing compared to you know you're going to bookmark the show with Roman Reigns you probably end the show with Roman Reigns but in between you got you have stuff in between so like you have McIntyre Shavis who's a good match but but I noticed from a formatting point of view that there's been a lot more shorter matches and um, I know seeing a lot more DQs and stuff like that for whatever reason. I don't know why that's the case, but uh, we had Charlotte Flair and Tony Storm in the championship contenders match. I liked I liked the match. I, I liked it for what it was. Um, and again, they're telling the story, and I think people just have blind hate towards Charlotte Flair, and they this good second guess every feud she's in. But when you look at the story that they're telling here, it's about the fact that Charlotte Flair in her head, feels that there's levels to this game and that Tony Tony Storm is not on uh, Charlotte Flair's level. You know what I mean? And I... I, I don't... I want to say I disagree with her, but it's an interesting program. You know, I know a lot of people are making a big fuss about the whole pie face thing, but again, it's just a plot point. It's not the end-all, be-all of the story. They're not going to have a pie match for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Uh, I did find it interesting that Sasha Banks was trying to talk up Tony Storm in the backstage area as if she's not going to turn her back on Tony Storm. Um, <laughs> by the way, folks, you leave Corey Graves the hell alone. Like, you know, let the guy put over his fiance. Like, come on. Uh, we had the main event for SmackDown this week was the Usos against New Day against RK Bro in a triple threat match. Um, pretty fun matchup, but uh, we had the New Day win. Uh, New Day would be fighting the Usos at day one. Uh, should be a pretty fun match. Uh, I looked at the card, man. Uh, we got uh, five matches in the card so far from day one. We got uh, Big E, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, and Bobby Lashley in a fatal four-way match for the WWE title. Uh, we got Roman Reigns and Brock Lesnar, obviously. We got the Usos and New Day for SmackDown Tag Team Titles. Edge versus The Miz. And then uh, announced this past Monday on Raw, we have now Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan for the Raw Women's Championship. So, Atlanta, you're getting yourself a good pay-per-view coming up uh, New Year's Day. It should be fun. Uh, for those who don't know, day one's going to be on a Saturday. So, it's not a Sunday pay-per-view. So, be on the lookout for that. I'll be obviously covering the pay per view on Pro Wrestling Transcriptions.com, which you should be bookmarking right now. Uh, let's talk about Raw this past Monday from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. We were supposed to have the finals of the RK Bro tournament, um, the Bro tournament, but uh, <laughs> uh, we had injuries for both the Mysterios and the Street Props, so they were unable to participate in said um, event for Monday, but. I found that they had another interesting thread throughout the show this week, and it was that is Bobby Lashley worthy of being in this match? So, uh, Raw decided to do a kind of mini gauntlet thing where Bobby Lashley had to fight all three guys that are already announced in the day one match, at, uh, the WWE title match at day one, and Bobby Lashley did just that. Bobby Lashley got himself. Uh, Added to the WWE title match at day one, it'll be a fatal four-way match, and I think it's going to be a barn burner. I say it a lot on this podcast, I think WWE is the best in the in the business when it comes to laying out triple threat matches and fatal four-ways or five-ways. 
they're some of the best matches that WWE produces throughout the week, but uh, throughout the year. And I, I'm really excited for this match. It should be phenomenal. And I don't know who's going to win. And that's the intriguing part here. So that uh, should be a lot of fun. And if anything, it'd be cool if it was the elimination match too. So we'll have to see how that goes. It's a fatal four way. Honestly, it's no disqualification. So uh, it's going to be a bar burger. And I can't wait for it. It should be an awesome match. Um, I will say this, man. Uh, the main thing I want to hit, hit on with WWE this week, especially this segment, is um, I feel like Raw has really gained more momentum over the last couple of weeks uh, than SmackDown. And uh, I want to give credit with Chris because I know a lot of people go out of the way to dog Raw. And I think at times it's justified, but I think other times it's not. Um, I think Raw has been really a better consistent show over this past few weeks or so. And I, Again, I thought Raw was another solid show this week. This week. I wouldn't say it was great or anything like that, but I thought Raw was, again, another solid show with uh, stuff that was worthwhile and Steve, you could see building towards the future as well. Um, you know, Otis being Matt Riddle, uh, th I thought that was a good match. Uh, I'm down for RK Bro against the Alpha Academy. That'd be a fun match. Um, you know, Bianca Belair beat Piper Niven. Another good match. Man, Matez is a lucky guy. That's all I'm going to say. That woman is beautiful. <laughs> All right, guys. Guess things have happened since uh, <laughs> these highlight clips of Veer, Meek Mahan. <laughs> like, Urban Meyer's been fired. Um, curious to see what happens next. I, I got a question for you guys. Who gets fired first? Mike, what happens first? Mike Zimmer or Matt Nagy get fired? Or... Veer shows up to Raw. That's my question for you guys. Uh, we had another good talk uh, with Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan. Um, their their program's been a lot of fun so far. I really like what they've been doing. And Becky's a very good heel. And I thought uh, her segment with uh, Liv was really good this week. You, you see the tension build between AJ Styles and Omos. As I was saying, I think Raw is doing a better job right now than SmackDown did. Uh, having a full, consistent show. And, um, you know, you had Damian Priest and Finn Balor against the Dirty Dogs. Dirty Dogs win thanks to interference from Austin Theory. Austin Theory is still trying to impress Vince McMahon, which led to the whole thing about the Eraser. Uh, again, I just thought it's a, uh, more... I think Raw's been doing a better job of putting an overall show than SmackDown over the last couple of weeks. Um... You know, Big Big E and Bobby Lashley's no DQ match was fantastic. Uh, same thing with Miz TV. Uh, so, yeah, big thumbs up for Raw this week for your your boy. I um, also wanted to mention this really quick as we wrap this up. I saw the news that Kevin Owens uh, is re-signing with WWE, which is great news for him and his family. Uh, I'm not going to expand further on that. I just want to say that it's kind of ridiculous that people are, are going on soapboxes for him, making a decision for himself. Do what you want to do. You know what I mean? Do what's best for you and your family. You don't have to speak. You don't have to make decisions for anybody. And the fact that people are trying to peer pressure this dude to go to AWs is fucking hilarious to me. But that's wrestling fans in 2021 for you. Um, so overall, solid week. Uh, for WWE this week, and also don't forget today, NXT UK, a new episode of NXT UK is dropping. We got Joe Coffey against Charlie Dempsey, uh, who's the son of William Regal. And of course, you got um, the main event, Nathan Frazier against the A-Kid. The winner of this match will become the number one contender for the NXT UK Heritage Cup uh, Championship. So, uh, Excited to see what goes down for NXT UK. You guys know how I feel about NXT UK. It's the best show that WWE produces. So, overall, good stuff this week. That's what happened this week in WWE. All right, folks, one more thing to do before we get to our main event segment of the podcast this week. I want to uh, quickly go over uh, the finals of the New Japan um, Best of Super Juniors Tournament and World Tag League as I've been documenting this tournament for the past month on ProWrestlingTranscripts.com. Um, 22 shows in total uh, between both tournaments. And um, 
a lot of work, a lot of um, a lot of transcripts, a lot of early mornings, but um, it was definitely worth it. I thought the finals was fantastic. Great to hear um, Kevin Kelly and uh, Chris Charlton on commentary. Shout out to uh, Kevin Kelly for uh, doing live commentary for the final show. That that, that guy's the man. He's uh, uh, it's one of the main reasons why I want to be a wrestling play by play guy. So I learned a lot from him, and he really helps me a lot when it comes to making these transcripts. So big shout out to Kevin Kelly. Uh, really big fan of his work. Uh, also a fan of Chris Charlton's work as well. Uh, so we had the finals of both the World Tag League and the Best Super Juniors. Uh, we had Chaos, Yoshihashi, and Hiroki Goto defeating the House of Crap, a.k.a. the House of Torture. Uh, uh, solid match, even with all the House of Torture bullshit. Uh, I'm really not a fan of how they are laying out their matches and everything has to do with evil cheating. and uh, like It's one thing for being the heel, then it's just making the referees look stupid. You guys know how I feel about that. One thing in Bull Club, you know, one thing, you can't have a regular tag match to save their life. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just calling the spade a spade. So, you had uh, Yoshihashi and Hiroki Goto uh, win that match. They are the 2021 World Tag League Champions. And then Hiromu Takahashi um, beat Yo in a 38-minute classic. You know, I know a lot of people are hyping up Brian Davidson and Heyman Page this week for Dynamite. It was a great match, and I'll get to that uh, in a little bit. But um, Hiromu Takahashi and Yo was fucking phenomenal, man. It was, um, it was definitely one of the best junior matches. Definitely lived up the namesake of the tournament. Um... It was phenomenal. You got to go out of your way to watch that match. It was really, really, really good. So, uh, congrats to Goto and Yoshihashi, and congrats to Hiromu Takahashi for SAR, the winners of the World Tag League and best of the Super Juniors. So, right now, I'm going to go over the announcement that came this morning, actually. We got the cards for uh, Wrestle Kingdom uh, night one and two at the Tokyo Dome. And uh, I'm going to read that to you guys, shall we? Let's get to it. So, of course, we have the uh, New Japan Rambo. Uh, and this will be involved for the KOPW 2022 Provisional Trophy. But here's the actual card for... Um, on uh, is, is this the 5th or the 4th? Okay, this is the 4th. This is, so, Russell King is going to be on a Tuesday... Oh boy, <laughs> it's gonna be a long, long day. Um, so we got Yo and Sho as the first match. We got a six man tag here with Tanahashi, Taguchi, and Rocky Romero against the Bull Club tandem of Kenta, Taiji Ishimori, and El Fantasmo. That should be good. Another six man tag here Naito, Sonata, and Bushi against Jeff Cobb, uh, Great Okada, and Will Ospreay. Osprey is going to be back. This will be his first match back in Japan. And uh, that should be an awesome match. Uh, that should be a lot of fun to take down. Um, now, those six-man tag matches right there are preview matches for um, Tanahashi and Kenta the next day. And then Naito and Jeff Cobb. So those are why those matches are happening. We got uh, Katsu Shibata against an opponent to be named later. I think it's either Cody Ibushi or Jay White. Yeah, it's going back to the question that Chris asked earlier. Well, what other matches are going to be added to this? I think it's Shibata and Jay White. I do like... I'll, I'll give New Japan credit for this. I do like the fact that they're keeping it as an eight-match card for both nights. I don't think you need to go out of your way to do ten-match cards. Um... I get it, it's Russell Kingdom, but uh, some of these matches are going to have a long length to it anyway, so eight matches is perfectly fine. Uh, I had no problem with that, and the fact that Shibata's on the January 4th show is even special. That That's pretty cool. Uh, how about this, guys? Ishii against Evil for the Never Open Weight Championship. That's going to be awesome. <laughs> uh, we have... Zack Sabre Jr. and Tai Chi, the Dangerous Tigers, putting their IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team titles on the line against uh, Hiroki Goto and Yoshihashi, as they are the winners of the World Tag League I just mentioned. Uh, and the semi-main event for uh, Russell Kingdom for Night 1 is El Desperado against Hiroko Takahashi. It's pretty cool that the junior heavyweights get to have the semi-main 
for um, Wrestle Kingdom. Uh, so El Desperado gets to run with Tanahashi. As we get closer to Wrestle Kingdom, I'll make sure to do a prediction, something like that, <laughs> to preview um, Wrestle Kingdom. All right. And then, of course, we got uh, the finals here. Shingo uh, Takagi putting his IWGP World Heavyweight title on the line against Kishisha Okada. Uh, that's the main event. That match is going to be fucking insane. So, th- night one is just a tremendous card all the round. Um, so, I'm really excited for that. And then, um, coming up for uh, the Wednesday uh, day for night two... We got a triple threat match. It's um, the champions Robbie Eagles and Tiger Mask against uh, the Mega Coaches and Fantasmo Ishimori. This is a triple threat match for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Titles. Um, that should be a good one. Stardom uh, Tag Team Match here. We got Mayu Yutani and Starlight Kid against Seiya Kaminati and Tom Nakano. Uh, there'll be a four-way match uh, for the KOPW title. Uh, basically, the last four participants in the the Rambo will fight each other uh, for the uh, KOPW title. Um, fourth match here, we have a six-man never openweight tag team title match with the champions Evil, Yujiro, and Sho taking on Hiroki Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yo. That should be a barn burner. Um, Sonata against the Great Okan. That should be interesting. Uh, we got Naito and Jeff Cobb. That's going to be insane. Um, Hiroshi Tanahashi against Kenta. The no DQ match for the IWGP United States Heavyweight Championship. And then whoever wins Okada and Shingo, the main event that night will be them against Will Ospreay. So... I just went over the first two cards for Wrestle Kingdom. Don't forget now, Wrestle Kingdom is three nights. We don't have the card just yet for the um, the big New Japan versus uh, Pro Wrestling Noah show, uh, which will be happening in the Yokohama. But I'm sure that information will come out soon, and we'll get. And I'll talk about it once that's announced right here at the Hoops Podcast. So. Uh, very excited. Russell Kingdom's right around the corner. That should be a lot, a lot of fun to talk about. So, um, if there's anybody around the wrestling landscape that covers New Japan like I do, you want to hear them talk about Russell Kingdom with me, let me know. Give me some suggestions on Twitter. I'd love to do a little preview for Russell Kingdom for you guys with somebody who covers uh, New Japan like I do. So, that'd be a lot of fun. All right. Enough jibber jabber. Let's, it's time to give the people what they want, what they've been waiting for, what they need. It's the best time of the week, otherwise known as What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. We're going to start this off in a three, two, one. So highbrow, CM. I don't know how you think of this stuff. I especially love the part. When you claimed I needed to stop running and face you like a man so you can move on to try to become a world champion. That's interesting, punk, because I didn't realize that having an undefeated streak in a string of underwhelming matches against underwhelming opponents made you championship material. I thought that just made you the new Ryback. I deserve a title shot because I beat Hangman just like I'm going to beat Dante Martin. Beat your meat. Beat, beat your meat. 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 It's time for... What the hell is wrong with AEW? Alright, you rascals, let's do it. What the hell is wrong with AEW? AK, what is it wrong with AEW? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with AEW. How about the fact that the Booker of the Year can't figure out how to format a show? How about that? We're still two years in and we can't even format a show properly. 
Uh, uh, how about this? How about the fact that we have Tony Schiavone throughout the entire show? Oh my God! Tony Khan's coming up with a big match announcement. A big match announcement. You know, as much as you, you love, he loves to hear his name mentioned a hundred million times throughout the broadcast. I'm surprised the Forbidden Door doesn't want to pop up on television. Why doesn't he come out and announce the match himself? How about that? And then all this buildup throughout the entire day. Oh, somebody's going to show up. All this big hype about new arrivals. Oh, we're going to have this big match for next week in Greensboro for the Holiday Bash. So... We have MJF and Dante Martin, the main event. I'll get to that a little bit because we'll talk about the stuff I didn't like. But, again, the premise of this show is just funny to me and how they format shows and the messaging, more importantly, is what's funny to me. So, Tony Schiavone is going out this way. Oh, my God, we're going to have this big match announcement for, um, for Holiday Bash, right? I thought, oh, this is cool. Maybe we get something interesting, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, you had FTR in the ring, and you know they just had this run in with the Briscoes uh, at Final Battle. Blah 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 blah. It'd be a cool match, but no, lights go out in the building. It's not the Briscoes. It's Darby Allen and Sting. Ah. Uh. All that hype and anticipation for a, a Sting and Darby lights out moment. You know, you could have got more weight out of that and, you know, this big announcement, this big trios match of CM Punk and Darby Allen and Sting against MJF and FCR and the Pinnacle. You know, you all you could have done that, you could have done that in the fucking beginning. How about that? <laughs> and after Burke Brawl and the lights go out all just for Sting and see about to announce the match. Really? And his thing too. We have to get into this conversation here. We have to talk about the balance of having great wrestling matches and then a great wrestling TV show. Or just a great TV show in general. What's the main thing that you should feel once a show goes off the air? You want more of it, right? You want to have things maybe open-ended and try to have something to talk about throughout the rest of the week as the builds into the anticipation for the next week's show. So, we decided to go for an hour time limit draw with Heyman Page and Brian Danielson this week on Dynamite for the AEW World title. No problem. Joined the match for the most part of it. Um, uh, it was very physical. Uh, I thought the layout was good for the most part of it. Uh, commentary still hit and miss in my eyes, but that is what it is. Um, I, I joined the match. My issue with Heyman Page and Bryant Danson is not that it ended in a draw. My my problem is, is that this wasn't how the show went off the air. Have the draw... Go off the air. Because if you're going to have a fucking milk dud of a reveal with Sting and Darby Allen to close off the show, what incentive do I have to watch Holiday Bash now? Outside of that trios, big, big special trios match that was announced, what we got in store for us? Oh, Malachi Black against Griff Garrison. Wow! <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Like, come on, guys. So... Brian Danson and Heyman Page this week was good. I, I Again, I'm never afraid to get credit with Chris. It was a fantastic match. It was really, really good. I had no issues with the draw. That's the route they wanted to go with. But, again, no, no follow-up to what's happening next or anything like that. It's just a bad decision. If you want to leave things open-ended, don't do it at the start of the show. Do it at the end of the show. At least you give people time to guess. Like, you, you like, I, I keep saying this. Like, AEW has this fatuation with dropping their load on their TV shows. And, like, we got to rush out seeing Punk and Adam Cole and our big signings out in the first hour. And then 
the rest of it in between, you're just like waiting for the show to fucking end. I'm not saying you're not getting good wrestling matches and stuff like that, but the antithesis of having a great wrestling match instead of having a good television show is something that I feel like AEW needs to take a step back and look into how they want Dynamite to be presented because having, you know, great wrestling matches is not just enough to keep people uh, engaged for your show. It may, it may keep your diehard fans. They'll put anything you put on TV over. Hell, they'll put over a Marco Stunt and uh, Brandon Cutlet match. There he did, because I saw it on fucking dark. My point is, the you're not getting the more bang for your buck for having longer wrestling matches. Yeah, is it cool for the dirt sheet guys? Is it cool for the people that enjoy long wrestling matches? Sure. That's cool. You want long TV matches? More power to you. But if the ending is going to be falling flat and you have nothing to do to make it have more interest in seeing a rerun of it, then what's the point of it? Or having a sloppy ass after birth brawl that we get all the time. Like. You know, it's one thing to have great wrestling matches, but how about some actual stories on this show? How about that? <laughs> the action cannot be the only story to what's happening here. And here's the thing, like, you know, great wrestling matches are good for that audience. It's not good for people that don't watch or know anything of your product. Hence why I keep mentioning we're two years into this promotion and there's still no fucking identity. Almost three years. So we, do we still want to run with the new company excuse? <laughs> I I love the match. I, I thought it was good. I, I, I enjoyed it. I'm excited if they do a rematch down the road for a pay-per-view. I think it's cool. I think Brian Danson's done a lot of good work in the ring. But again... There's, There has to be more thought put into the television formatting of the show than, oh, let me put out what nice fantasy magic that I put this week that Meltzer could give five stars to. There has to be more thought put into that. And I get it, TK, you got Meltzer and Alvarez as far as the creative team. But great wrestling matches and stuff like that is just... It's, it's, it could be either good or it could be hit or miss. And that's the feeling I left with a lot of times with Dynamite. Yeah, is there a great match here and there? Of course. There's a lot of good wrestling on AEW. But there's also times in the show that I just want to rip my fucking hair out and just want to ask myself, what am I doing with myself? You know? Like, why are we putting an emphasis on Sean Spears trying to Team Wardlow. Who buys Sean Spears? Who believes in Sean Spears? Who gives a flying fuck about Sean Spears? And then we have Hikaru Shida and Serena D. Part 3. Again, another case example of a good match, but do I have the emotional investment attached to it? Or it's just another match that's just there. Really enjoyed the match announcement with uh, I really enjoyed the promo from NGF before his match with Dante Martin. Uh, that was fantastic. That's why I replayed it here before the segment started. Uh, NGF's the man. I would say, man, NGF's one of the few reasons why I keep my interest in AEW from a fan standpoint. But that guy is just a gem, a complete mensch. He may say some stuff about my city I don't like, but, you know, it is what it is. I appreciate NJF. Um, <laughs> we had a couple announcements for Rampage this week. Oh, boy. Let's get the good out of the way. We have Ty Conti. Shout out shout out to Ty Conti. Uh, she'll be taking out Penelope Ford. Shout out to Penelope Ford, by the way, as well. Uh, they'll be fighting each other in a submission match on Rampage this week. That should be pretty good. We also got an announcement of not one multi-person tag matches, but two of them. And not it's not a trios match. It's an eight-man tag, and it's a ten-man tag. Fuck 
me. I am screwed this week. My God. So let's do the roll call here, shall we? We have Adam Cole and Bobby Fish. Mr. I do the same thing every five seconds in the ring. And the Hardly Boys taking on Pockets, Rocky Romero, and Best Friends. Love seeing Trent in the ring. Glad that he's back. But here comes their eight-man tag team much show. And how about this one to top it that? We don't need one multi-person tag match. We need two of them. How about this one? We have... Eddie Kingston, Proud and Powerful, and the Lucha Brothers against uh, Daniel Sabre Jr. 2.0 and the Acclaimed. (laughs) Oh my god. You know, if anything, the only saving grace... For those two matches, if if you put referee Tony S as the referee in that match, <laughs> oh my god! Hey folks, man, A W A W. Um, I, I outside the draw, and you know, I I, I like the match with MJF and Dante Martin, but that's not enough to suffice for another two hours of TV. That's just there for me. I I don't feel like taking away. Nothing from the show took my breath away. Uh, I thought it was fine. I, I wouldn't say this was a great addition to Dynamite or anything like that, but you know, a, an hour limit draw and everything else just you know, shoulder shrug. That's my takeaway from Dynamite this week. So, on that note, folks, <laughs> TK, man, you know, it's one thing to be a mark for yourself in booking these. Uh, matches for five star ratings from Meltzer, then it's another thing for having a TV show that actually appeals to people who don't subscribe to the fucking Wrestling Zuber newsletter. On that note, that is what the hell is wrong with AEW this week. This has been What the Hell is Wrong with AEW. Alright guys, thank you for hanging out with me for another awesome uh, edition of the Who's Podcast. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Uh, coming up this weekend, I have a Impact pay-per-view uh, to type down this weekend. They're doing some type of throwback gimmick, shame it's Fernand Burnham um, in Kentucky. So uh, it's called Impact Throwback Throwdown. I'll be curious to see what the card looks for that show. I'll be covering that on ProRCTransfers.com. Also, don't forget, uh, we got three uh, Road to Tokyo Dome shows next week that I'll be uh, typing down as we get closer and closer to Wrestle Kingdom. Um, I want to make sure you guys uh, understand that you guys can uh, check out the show every single week. It drops here on Thursdays on the uh, Apple Podcast, Spotify, anywhere you get your podcasts from. Type in the Who's Podcast. It's right there. Uh, subscribe. Uh, leave us a, If you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a four or five star uh, rating and review. Uh, I want to know what you guys like about the podcast or anything you want to see change with the podcast as we head towards 2022. And uh, we appreciate all the f- support that we get on social media as well. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at Josh Lopez Media, at Josh Lopez 94. That's J O S H I E Lopez 94 on uh Twitter, uh, also on uh, Instagram, and all the fun stuff's there. As always, make sure to book for our products at transcription.com. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Remember, folks, be the authentic product that is yourself, and always remember nobody dictates the pace of your life but yourself. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. The countdown to 300 continues. We'll be back here for episode 289 next week, right here on the Hoots Podcast. Go get yourself some waterfall. Enjoy your day. Enjoy some football as well. Uh, I'll catch you guys all next week. I love you guys. Let's talk to you later. Yes, sir.